stand there's a table here to lean but not stand because you can't sit on the corner of that desk that would not be a good place to sit you could ruin some expensive equipment yes ma'am but you could kind of sit right there that'd be good because my feet are you could take your shoes off and we wouldn't even know it <laughs> that's an idea too we could have a class rule for tonight Everybody takes their shoes off. <laughs> I don't know, though. You might have to leave. I know. I'm like, oh, it's not a bad thing. Well, like, oh, that's a lot of feet. I don't know. <laughs> well, see, we wouldn't know who it was, would we? <laughs> like, have you ever seen those guys in airplanes where they take your shoes off? You know, and I'm thinking, are you at home? Put your shoes up. You know, no, you're back there. They spend so much time on an airplane that they are at home on I don't care. <laughs> I don't want stinky feet in the seat next to me. And some of them put slippers on on an airplane. Yeah. Especially going cross country because your feet swell. You know that. Yeah, but I'm not the one sitting there with my feet off. I mean, my shoes off. Why not? <coughs> I guess because I got manners. <laughs> and they don't. <laughs> In case you can't tell, Christy and I are personal friends as well as business associates. It doesn't show, does it? Um, she knows where my skeletons are buried and I know where hers are. So, you know, do you have a friend that's such a good friend that she's, she knows so much she's a forever friend? Because, boy, if she was your enemy, your life would be over, huh? As you know it today, it would change. That's the kind of friends we are. We also have a working relationship. Um, Chrissy owns a consulting company, and every once in a while, I work for her. It's really hard. <laughs> sometimes. Okay. Sometimes not so hard. Yeah. It's the good days when you work real hard. Yeah. Then you got a lot of work to do. And we have this rule, though. If you ever work with friends, before you start to work together, you need to decide which is top priority, friendship or work. Because when your best friend becomes your boss, there are expectations that your boss doesn't normally have. <coughs> or there are expectations that your boss normally has, but you don't expect them from your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> And the line gets very gray. Yes. <laughs> and so sometimes you just have to go, okay, is it business or is it friendship? And be sure you understand each other's priorities. Because for me, my priority is the college. For Christy, the priority is her consulting business. <clears throat> Priority is making money. <laughs> <coughs> you okay? Yeah. And actually, that's only partially true. When I'm at work, that's one priority. But as right. we all know, family interferes. I'm going to take first. attendance. Anybody who comes in after this is late. Just let me know when you want me to get started. Here. 
Esther. Let's see, Esther. Megan. Rhonda. Rhonda's not here. Thea's not here. Romeo's not here. Brian's not here. Antoinette. You didn't tell me tell them about me in the head of time, did you? Is that why they didn't come? I don't know. Maybe they felt you coming. Yeah, I Mia. Oops. And Elise. I turned over the carpet right there. We have a new student joining us tonight in the back of the room is Elise. Elise, say hi to everybody. Hello. You didn't call my name. Oh, what's your name? Myesha. You called me last Tuesday. Oh, okay. What's your last name? Oh, what's your last name? Lustin. 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 Myesha, you're not on here. I have, I will see. Okay. <clears throat> Maisha, are you in one of my other classes? Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, I see. I knew I recognized your name. <laughs> class? Uh-uh. I was here last Tuesday. Did you come in late, maybe? Mm -mm. You got, you call, called my name last Tuesday. <coughs> you just didn't call my name today. It's not on the list. I wonder why I called it last And you said you had a different list last week mm -hmm. when you came in. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Christy, did you find the I can show you. I can't tell you. Oh, I remember where it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, you remember last week we talked about um, equal pay? And the article that was in the Parade <coughs> magazine. Mm -hmm. I'm stalling as best I can. <laughs> well, in Friday, last Friday's news and record, there's an article. Did anybody, did any of you see it? That says Senate approves bill for equal pay. How many of you saw it? Okay. Remember that would have been good for us. Well, no, I got it on the internet, and I actually have it, but I didn't want to say it if you were going to say it. Oh, okay. Well, do you want to tell us about it? You guys yeah. want to see the AT building? Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other young lady was over there somewhere. Mm -hmm. I saw her. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But I know so, she was standing up there when I came down. So. You guys tell me who you are. Betty Eason. <laughs> Esther Locklear. Okay, and one more. Loranda Moore. Oh, Loranda, you got your hair different. I didn't recognize you. Mm hmm. Okay. <coughs> Loranda, is the other one Thea or Romeo? The young lady that said she was taking it because she had to, she has kind of short hair, mm -hmm. sat on the left side of the room. That's Nicole. Yeah, I saw her standing out or over there at the AT building, <coughs> at the AT building also. Because the change was put on <coughs> Moodle, and I told you last week to look for a change in room. Okay, you want to tell us, Megan, about what happened? Well, mine says um, the changes existing law, which is talking about holding that cases of discrimination in the workplace have a 180-day statute of limitations in which someone can make a claim going from paycheck to paycheck, uh, stating that she... She couldn't have filed a discrimination complaint within the 180 days required by law, even though evidence did show she did suffer discrimination in pay. The Act changes the rules on the statute of limitations by assigning the 180-day limit to each paycheck. In other words, every time someone gets paid, that person has a new 180 days in which to file a pay discrimination claim. 
Okay. And anybody remember the name of the woman who caused all this? Ledbetter was her last name. Right. And how many years did she work for the company before she found out she was being discriminated against? 20. 19. 19. Close enough, 19. Okay. And so the Senate approved the Equal Pay Act. And Barack Obama strongly supported the legislation and should sign it into law sometime this week. And um, I think that's a real coup because he is so pro-labor. But it shows that he is very much in favor of being fair. Because the reason this all became an issue was because <clears throat> how is it fair if you don't know you're being discriminated against then that doesn't make it any more fair but if you don't know how can you complain so I think this act is going to really hurt employers and should make employers significantly aware of what's going on with their payroll okay our special guest tonight is Christy Evans Christy came down from Raleigh to talk with us, and we are going to record Christy's presentation tonight. Um, I want to use it for a couple of things. One, I want to put it up on Moodle so that you can look at it a second time, because Christy's going to talk about things that you will be tested on, and you do have handouts of her presentation so that um, you can make notes. Um, much of this is covered in um, the books that you were supposed to read for tonight and then there's material that's not covered in as much detail in the book. Christy has been the director of benefits um, for several companies and I'll let her explain more to you about her background but um, she will be able to offer you stories of experience to go along with the facts and I, I think that's one of the most important things about Christy's presentation is that she can tell you what it's really like in the real world and for those of you that haven't had me before one of the things that I want you to leave every class with is what the real world is like versus what the theory is okay because we teach you a lot of theory in college we teach you the way it should be and we'd like you to go out in the workplace and help make it the way it should be. But the reality is, there are people out there. And people will do what they can get away with. And how long can you get away with something that's not legal? Until you get caught. Absolutely right. <clears throat> Until you get caught. And so it's very important with the careers you've chosen, whether it's management or human resources, that you know the difference between right and wrong and you've set an ethical standard and you have, know what the professional standards are so that you can make your decision which one of those people you're going to be. So Christy, I'm going to turn them over to you and we'll take a break in about an hour at 7.15, okay? And feel free to ask Christy questions as she goes along. Hi. Good evening. Hello, I'm good. Thanks for letting me come in and talk to you this evening. I'm excited to be here. And um, I don't know about telling you lots of stories about people doing stuff wrong. <laughs> I can tell you stories about insurance companies doing stuff wrong. And I can tell you other stories. But basically what we're going to get into today is we're going we're to talk a little bit about how you develop a benefit strategy and what that's composed of. And I think one of the most important things to consider, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moving around, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Um, one of the most important things to consider is that um, benefits is really very financially driven. So if you're looking at um, getting into human resources and, and looking at working with people and everything, this piece of human resources is all about, um, it's a lot about expense, it's a lot about money, about risk, and about financial management. So when you start to get into developing something like a benefit strategy, here's some questions that you need to, to ask as you start to consider, you know, what are we going to do with our money for this company? A lot of it has to do with how big the company is, how many employees are you going to cover, what kind of benefits budget are you going to put together, and you're going to want to know, you know, why is this company providing benefits to start with? Companies do it for a lot of different reasons. 
Sometimes they do it, well, for one thing, to be competitive. Sometimes they do it in a mixture of trying to keep salaries lower and push benefits <coughs> up. Sometimes they do it as a matter of goodwill to their employees. It's part of recruitment and retention. So there are a lot of different questions that help you defi define for that company, for the company you're working for, what's this supposed to accomplish? What am I supposed to get done with this as a part of a total rewards package? It's, it's part of, you know, you have compensation on one side, and then you've got um, benefits on the other. Um, retention, recruitment, competitiveness, goodwill, tax deductions. All of these are part of a benefits package and a benefits strategy. Tax deductions, you know, the, the employer's expenses are tax deductible in most instances. So that's one of the financial aspects of it that you're going to run into. And I think, um, you, yeah, you've got a copy of the presentation. So, you know, a lot of these notes will be available to you easily. <coughs> When you start looking at assessing a benefit strategy, you're really looking at um, a lot of different components. For example, you want to take a look at what's your organizational strategy. We talked about that a second ago. An example of an organizational strategy is, you know, SAS is a really popular company to work for. Everybody loves to go to work there. But traditionally, SAS has been a company where the salaries are lower and the benefits package is richer. So everybody talks about what a great place it is to work, how wonderful, you know, they got M&Ms on the counters everywhere, all that kind of stuff. It's the benefits, though, that are rich and attract the employees. The salaries are not as market competitive as other companies. That's their philosophy. That's the strategy they use, and it's been very successful. It's been very <coughs> successful. And that's not the only piece of that strategy. You know, part of that strategy is also, you know, what kind of culture are you creating for your employees, and how do you treat them, and how do you... Um, give them opportunities to develop as people and training and all those kinds of things help too. That's also part of your compensation policy. We talked about how you've got money on one side, what you're actually getting in that paycheck, and then what you're getting in benefits. So the tangible and the intangible. Review your employee needs. What kinds of employees do you have? Do you have a workforce, for example, a workforce in a hospital is composed of a lot of young women in childbearing age. And so a lot of your benefits expenses when you're looking at health care expenses are going to be taking care of families, you know, childbearing and those kinds of things because that's a big chunk of your population. You go to a manufacturing environment, you might have a lot of men in their 40s that have been there for 20 years. And traditionally, what generally tends to be the axiom in health insurance is that it's your young women and your older men that cost you the most money. Because the women are, are bearing children in their younger years and the men I don't know what happens to the men, but they start kind of fall apart. <laughs> they start to cost a lot of money as you get to be. <laughs> so that's kind of the, you know, that's the mix. And so you look at your employee population. You review your current benefits. What do we currently have to work with? You know, because you don't want to go to a basic package A to F. You don't have the money to make that stretch. It's too much of a stretch. So you want to look at what you've got. And then you want to sort of conduct a needs assessment and put those pieces together. A little bit of research. Because we talked about, remember, that there's a lot in benefits that has to do with finance, has to do with risk, um, expense management. It's not just about going out and buying insurance. It's really a, a bigger financial piece than that. Benefits are expensive. One of the things that I, it surprised me when I did a little bit of research working into this um, presentation is that na they now estimate that benefits can be as much as 40% of your gross payroll. That's a huge number. For any company, that's a huge, huge number. If I'm paying, if I have five employees and I'm paying them $20,000 a piece and that's $100,000, that's an extra $40,000 on top of that that I have to try and manage as an employer that I have to figure out how I'm going to pay for. I'm not getting any, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Oh, um, you talk about how um, benefits are very expensive, mm -hmm. very expensive um, for a company. Um, what percentage of profit do they want to um, be in as far as when comparing it to benefits? Like, do they want, how high do they want their profit level to be as far as, or how high should a company's profit level be to, as a, um, compared to benefits? Are you thinking about the margin? Yes. Um, <coughs> gosh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Uh, because margins differ so much by industry. You know, for example, when you're looking at healthcare, a lot of the margins are really small 
in, in hospitals and stuff because Medicare is the biggest payer. So government keeps reducing the amount of money they pay to hospitals, which means they pass more along to insurance companies and things like that. So those margins are tight. Some of the other margins, you know, you get into something like um, the pharmaceutical industry, they've got pretty big margins. A lot of investment dollars going into R&D and stuff like that, but they've got a lot of money between, and the margin we're talking about is, is the margin between how much money I spend and how much money I make. So what's the difference between my net expense and my gross revenue? You know, that's, that's my profit margin. And so I'm not sure that there's, you know, what probably happens instead is that you look at that margin for your industry and then you say, okay, we can afford to do this. You know, so you look at your margin first and then decide. I don't think there's any magic number. And Brian, later Christy will talk about um, things like comparing benefits in your industry to uh, benchmarking against other people in your industry. This is just a general number at this point, and it used to be 33%. So the benefit expense has gone up a lot, and it's going to continue to go up, or employers are going to pull back and start cutting benefits. And I think, Christy, you're going to talk about that later too, aren't you? Yeah, or actually, we, we talk about the financial aspect of it a lot in this presentation because it really is a very financially driven segment of human resources and I think a lot of times um, that is overlooked in the overall scheme of what human resources do. It's really a lot of risk management and you need to really work with finance within the organization where you're, you're managing benefits. I mean, at one point I was managing a benefits budget that was about $40 million. <coughs> Whenever that budget spiked because maybe in December a lot of times you get a lot of year-end claims, a lot of health care starts, people are going to the doctor, finishing up the year, finishing their deductibles, you know, all that other stuff. You get a big push and that spikes. If you're self-insured, you see that spike in, in insurance go up and, uh, you know, CFO would be in my office going, you know, what's up with this million dollars here? We budgeted for 600000 and we've got a million five and, you know, I'd go, Go to the doctor, what do you want me to do? <laughs> but basically, what you're saying is, you know, I need to be watching the money. I need to know why it's happening and where it's happening. I need to plan ahead for it as much as I can. I need to be prepared for that because you're going to have to justify it and defend it. And they're going to expect you to manage the dollars. So, and, and Christy's a good one to tell you. The biggest mistake that HR people make is what, Christy? <clears throat> Not knowing enough about the business to manage the money. <coughs> That would be my, my position, yeah. And we have both seen that in our professions when we were practitioners, mm -hmm. is if you don't understand the money, you don't understand how finance looks at the money, you don't understand what your profit margin is, like you were talking about, Brian, and you don't understand the cost of your own program. Most companies will not go into that detailed audit of each claim. A lot of companies don't look at, you've got companies with 16,000 employees, when you get a bill from the insurance company, you have to look line by line by line to make sure that the person on your plan is your employee <coughs> and is supposed to be on that plan. How many times have we found that somebody, some other company's employee was put on our plan and we were billed for it? Or that our employee didn't get on the plan so they were having all their claims rejected? Or that there was somebody left on the plan who wasn't paying on COBRA, wasn't paying for the plan, and here they are six months later. They're still showing up on the plan, and we've got a million dollars worth of claims for them, and they're not paying for the insurance. So see why the finance piece of this is so important? Well, you know, there was a few years ago, there was an article in the newspaper where the state of North Carolina was, play, was paying a pensioner <coughs> that was deceased. That didn't really make them look good. <laughs> so, you know, there is a lot of management, and, and one of the things that, make, that Nikki's making me think of is that technology helps in trying to manage some of this volume, and that's one of the things that you see in the HRS systems that are coming out. 
um, is trying to do some electronic data file exchanges to where you don't have to go through this line by line anymore, that you feed the data back and forth between your insurance companies and manage your roster better that way. But it, there are still a lot of companies doing it manually because, you know, technology is also expensive to put in and it takes time to manage and that kind of thing. But benefit plans each have this component or one of these components. No, benefit plans each have all of these components is what I'm trying to say. What I mean by that is they all have an element of expense and risk, discrimination, compliance, regulatory compliance, and communication. Every element exists in every benefit plan to a greater or lesser extent. It really kind of depends on what the program is as to how much that really exists within that program. So when you're looking at creating a benefits budget, you can start with just that ballpark figure of 40%. And then you can go into deducting about 20% because your company is going to get a tax deduction for that expense. So take a piece off of that. <clears throat> and then we're just getting to a ballpark, a big ballpark number. Then you need to think about how much am I going to pass along to the employees? Because most companies, you have um, cost sharing going on for some of those benefits. You know, like if it's a, um, a health insurance, you're going to have a copay maybe, or you're going to have part of the premium that you have that you come that comes deducted out of your paycheck. If it's a dependent care spending account, it's all going to come out of your spending or out of your payroll check. You know those kinds of things. You need to back out that stuff, and then you're going to get to your net expense. That's where you're trying to get so that you know what that number is that you have to manage. Your net benefit expense is composed also of things that the state requires, state or federal, federal regulations require. It's also required of any expenses that the employer has to pay, and it's, it's um, composed of any kind of trending or risk projection that you need to put in there. For example, if I know that my medical claims are running at $150,000 this year, and the trend for medical claims is about 8%, then I need to lop on an extra 8% onto that as I look at my budget for next year. The other thing I might consider is, do I have an aging workforce? Do I anticipate that claims might go up more than that 8% that's trend because my workforce is older than some of the other guys? So those are the kind of the financial decisions you make when you're looking at this budget overall. Let's go through some of the um, benefits that are required. And uh, please, just as we've had one person already, if you want to stop me, ask me questions, please do so because I'll just talk to you about <laughs> so, you know, feel free. So you've got your FICA tax, your payroll taxes. When they talk about, in our economic situation right now, when they talk about getting money immediately into the hands of the consumers and reducing the payroll tax, they're talking about the FICA and Medicare tax. Because 7.65% comes out of your paycheck and your employer pays 7.65% as well. So that's an immediate hit that they could actually reduce some of the taxes coming out of your payroll check immediately if they chose to take that path. But that's money that goes into the big social security bucket in the sky. So that's all feeding into that system. Unemployment insurance is required by both state and federal based on the number of employees you have and it's based on a pretty minimal amount. Then workers' compensation required. COBRA, your um, continuation of health insurance benefits required. Family Medical Leave Act required. Is it the same percentage for FMLA all the time? The percentage that they pay out is it always 66 and two thirds, or does it change per company? You're thinking of short term sure. disability. Actually, FMLA is the benefit that protects your job when you go out on leave. It doesn't guarantee you payment. Oh. So, disability, that 66 and two thirds sounds like a disability plan, and that's going to be attached to short term disability or long term disability. Okay? Well, I, know, I was thinking because the company that I worked for when I had my children to leave. I had to apply for my F or I had to put in for FMLA in order to be off for it. Right. So right. Okay. And they may have just they may have had you complete the FMLA paperwork and then use that paperwork to do the disability okay. paperwork as well, so that you didn't do two sets. Okay. Yeah. You might have killed bird, two birds with one stone. The only place where you will get paid for FMLA <clears throat> out of state funds is California. <clears throat> 